Are you in that dark place? Do you want to be free? We'll tell you how coming up next right here on The Right Stuff. Hi, and welcome to The Right Stuff. I'm the queen, Parker J. Thank you so much for joining me. Today, we are going to be talking to my returning guest co-host and contributor today, Frank Lattimore. You may be wondering, is he related to Kenny Lattimore? No, he's not related to Kenny Lattimore. However, he has been on this show before. He is just a wonderful guest that I am so excited to reconnect with him again. He was with us when we started in the beginning. And as we get ready to celebrate 10 years of right stuff, I am so excited to showcase him again. So I can't wait to tell you and introduce you to him in just a few moments. As always, I want to thank you for your support. We have been showcasing Christian authors worldwide for the past nine years. And as God gives us grace, we'll continue to do so. To find out how you can help out, simply go to patreon.com slash right stuff and see what you can do. And as always, we covet your prayers. To stay up to date with PJC Media, simply go to pjcmedia.net. Click on that pink follow button and you'll never, ever have to miss a show. Subscribe to our new YouTube channel at youtube.com slash at PJC Media. You'll see my lovely face in the right stuff. We are in the process of uploading a lot of the shows from our blog talk to our YouTube channel. So just click the bell and you'll always be notified of a new episode and exclusive content on YouTube. Lastly, I want to thank you all for your support of my newest release called A Chance for Shaoxin. It's part of the Last Bride series. If you like the Blizzard Brides, you'll love this one as well. It's a continuation from that series 15 years later in the 1890s. Your response has been absolutely phenomenal. And if you haven't had a chance, go ahead and get your copy today exclusively at Amazon.com. And so without further ado, I'm going to bring Frank on board. Frank, how are you doing today? Hi, Parker. Thanks for having me on your show. And I want to say first that I'm very appreciative of the outlet that you give to authors across the board. And uh, your show is is exposing others out there who are big readers and other authors out there to uh, some really good talent. I uh, hope that I can fit into that category at some point. But Parker, also congratulations on 10 years of making people's lives a little bit more fun and a little bit more interesting with your show. Oh, Frank, thank you so much. But you are already in the club. Like I tell people all the time, I don't interview boring authors. I interview some of the best talent in the world, particularly in Christian fiction. So I am so excited to showcase you. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to be here with me today. It's been a minute since the last time you were here. And I have to tell our listeners, we were with another network at the time when Frank would join us. And when he aired his show, we were going live. So many people called in and were just asking for prayer. They were really stimulated by what he had to say. And now we're back again with the last book in this series. The series is called The Other Realm Saga. We'll get to that in just a few moments because we're going to talk about that dark place, what I alluded to earlier. But some of our newer listeners may not know who you are, Frank. So go ahead and share a little bit about yourself. Well, I started writing back in 2006. My first book took me about five years to accomplish, but I've always been a storyteller. I've I've written for the stage, written for some short films, but I always thought that I might be able to have a uh, a story come out in print. And so I, I set out to do that, thinking that a dark period in my life might create the the background for a good story. And 12 chapters into that first book, I realized that I didn't have any more to write. And I was like, well, that doesn't make a book. So I had to learn how to write straight fiction. And so that's why it went from, oh, a good uh, few months of writing 12 chapters to another four years of trying to figure out how to accomplish an entire book and getting that done. But I'm satisfied with how the first book turned out. And a lot of people have really said that it's had an impact in their lives. And I'm really grateful for that. And that caused me to want to keep on writing. I've got a military background. I served in the U.S. Air Force for two enlistments, and 
that I bring up because I am currently writing a, a World War II book. And so my military background got me going, gosh, I would love to be able to write something. So World War II should be a lot of fun. I'm uh, about, I don't know, maybe 10 chapters into writing that one right now. A lot of research. And so the struggle continues, Parker. Writing is not always a joyful experience. Sometimes it's just angry. Sometimes it's like, oh my gosh, where did those seven hours go? So hopefully I'll be able to produce a fifth book that people really appreciate and uh, keep going from there. World War II fiction is actually quite popular right now. And there's a movie coming out with the guy who played Scarecrow. And he played in that movie about the sun darkening. I cannot remember his name. He's playing the guy Oppenheimer. That's what it was. Oppenheimer, who was the gentleman who created the atomic bomb. And that movie's coming out. And the way they're doing the marketing is that they're showing the countdown to when that movie comes out. And it's very interesting that you talk about World War II, because right now, with tensions being high in the international arena between all these various world governments, People are like, OK, are we going to have to learn how to live in a nuclear age? And that creeping dread hovers over a lot of people. But what makes it different for those of us who are Christians is that we know that the Lord is going to take care of us regardless as to what happens around us. And your Other Realm saga touches on this as well. And we'll get to it in just a few moments. One thing that you said that I have to resonate with, you said sometimes writing is not easy. <laughs> sometimes it is angry. I know for myself, there are times where writing can have its hellish moments, even though I enjoy writing. I enjoy the process. I love creating characters and love stories and romances that explore history. So I definitely understand where you're coming from. And so, Frank, I know you would agree with me. If someone said, oh, writing is easy, they're obviously not a writer. <laughs> they wouldn't have a clue what it meant to write a story. And I want to talk about something you said. You said that it took you four years to get that first book out. I want you to encourage someone else who may be experiencing that same delay, if you will, because they're like, this should be out by now. How come so-and-so can write a book in six months? And it's already taken me eight years. Talk to that person for me. Well, the thing that I want to stress probably the most is don't give up on your baby. All right. You're giving birth to something and that child of text is worthy of being finished. Don't give up on it thinking that you got a better story. The thing that we need to do as authors is we need to accomplish. We need to have the end typed. And if we don't, we're going to be discouraged going into another book. And that's not a good way to start a second book, let alone the way to leave off a first. So stick with it. Be patient. A lot of times, it's not a matter of not knowing what to write. It's a matter of allowing your characters to help write the story with you. And you can plot out your story and all of a sudden you get halfway through what you've written and you're like, it doesn't make sense for me to go where I want it to go. I want it to go there because that's what I designed it to be. But my character is saying to do something else. And you've got this internal war with your character. And you know what? Your character is almost always right. Allow your character to make a change of direction for you and allow the story to flow from there. If you know where your ending is, it doesn't matter if you're traveling by GPS and going the fastest route or if you are going to wing it and take some off the beaten path travel experiences where your characters want to go. So, yeah, I just say, keep going. Don't stop. Get that first one. The first one doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be published, but it's going to be the first one that you'll ever be able to brag about. I love the fact that you said, let your characters tell the story as well as yourself, because characters know what they are going to do. And I remember when I had problems with one of my books I was working on, and it is chapter four. And chapter four of my current whip was kicking my tail. It would not come together. And it finally came together. But as I read the story to go to the next chapter, chapter four just wasn't fitting. And then finally, I said, why can't I get these two characters together? Because they worked so well in the first book of this particular series. And I said, what is going on? They're not cooperating. 
then all of a sudden I was sitting here thinking and I heard the character say, we don't want to be in this book. We want our own story. And I said, OK. And then as I was sitting there, I said, oh, my gosh, they want a Christmas story. It's an Irish couple. They want a Christmas story. I said, well, if that's what you want, you could have told me this several weeks ago. <laughs> and we could have went on up with our business. And yeah, so I totally understand what you mean, Frank, about letting your characters tell the story. And I'm so glad you shared that with us. Now, the characters do tell the story in your Other Realm saga. And your Other Realm saga really explores spiritual warfare in different facets. And so for the books in the Other Realm saga, we have Deliver Us from Darkness. The second is When Darkness Comes. The third book is Behind the Darkness. And the fourth book, which you're going to talk about today, is That Dark Place. And so these are the four books that you've created in the Other Realm Saga. And we'll talk about each of them in the short nuggets, but we're really going to get into depth in the last book, That Dark Place, which is available online wherever books are sold. What gave you the idea of the Other Realm Saga? Well, it started off, as I had said, that I had a dark time in my life. I was about 13 years old when things started to get a little rough in our home. I had a younger brother and sister, mom and dad, and mom and dad's arguments started getting angrier and more intense. I started putting some fear into our lives. And uh, as a result, I started to try to mask the pain a little bit, you know, experimenting with like, what would sniffing glue do for me? Or what would my friend's joint do if I took some puffs on that? And should I look for some other ways to kind of escape? And one of the ways that crept into my life without me realizing it was something that I thought was a gift. And this had this ability to find things just by concentrating on what they were. And I thought, wow, God gave me a really cool gift and I ought to use it. Long story short, these gifts turned out to be something that I realized were demonic and they created terrible nightmares. And so I had to come to the realization that I had involuntarily gotten involved in the occult and it took deliverance for me to get out of it. And that came as a result of my high school track coach, George Hallis. Hey, George, he introduced me to Jesus. And as a result of getting a one-on-one -on -one intro to the Savior, everything left. All the nightmares stopped. All of the suicidal tendencies that I had stopped. The experimenting with, you know, glue and pot and all that kind of stuff stopped. Alcohol stopped. So uh, at age 16, I had such a huge experience with God's grace that I wanted to make sure that I was always telling about it. And when I was in my 30s, I thought, well, what the heck? You know, maybe I can start writing and affecting people's lives with that. So that's where the Other Realm Saga was birthed from, was having experiences with the occult and wanting to warn others about it and showing a better way. I love that you shared about your experience. We've talked about the occult with several guests on the show before, and the occult is extremely subtle. But once you get caught up in it, it is extremely difficult for you to pull away from it. And so I'm glad that the Lord shows he is more powerful than anything else in the world to take away our strongholds. And I'm glad that the Lord used that experience so you can share it with others and you share it with others in your Other Realm Saga. There's four books to the series. Dear listener, go ahead and pick up every one of them wherever books are sold. Now, we're going to talk about the fourth book in the series, but I do want to touch base on just each of the books in this series. Let's start with book one. Okay, well, it was fascinating to me to have to kind of look back at what I'd written. I, I had a conversation with Ted Decker once, and he asked me about the themes of each one of my books. And the question caught me off guard. I, I didn't have a quick answer for him. He told me that he has a reason for each book he writes other than just for entertainment. And I thought, wow, if I could go back and find a word or a theme for each of my books, what would they be? So the first book, Deliver Us from Darkness, is all about temptation. And the second book deals with anger and hatred. The third book deals with control. How much control can a person actually have in this life? And if he's given exceptional abilities to control things, 
what would he do and how would that play out in his life and in the lives of others? And then the last one, that dark place, the theme is forgiveness. How dark can we get into a place and still be forgiven? And how dark can things be that are done to us and still be able to forgive? I think of all of those themes, forgiveness is probably the hardest one, particularly when we have been hurt by other people. But I also think forgiveness is hard, too, if we are the perpetrator. So there's a lot going on with forgiveness. Our church did a series on forgiveness, and it was really interesting when my pastor said forgiveness is not human. And he said it is something that the Lord has to help you with. And we, of course, you always use Peter. You know, what did Peter say? How many times should I forgive my brother? Seven, <laughs> 70, seven times seven. You know, he only got a few of these, <laughs> you know. So I love that you're tackling on these various subjects. Now, Decker, as soon as he said Decker, my heart just jumped because Decker is a big wig in the Christian arena. And you may know him from books like Three. You may know him from the Circle series, his daughter's writing now. So yeah, Decker is probably a good mentor to have, Frank. <laughs> so that's kind of cool. That's kind of cool to have it there. But we're going to talk about That Dark Place. And That Dark Place is book four of the Other Realm Saga. Before we do that, I want to preface it with That Dark Place deals with certain things that I call private sins. These private sins are the ones that only me and the Lord know about unless we bring someone else into the fold. These are sins that we don't want people to be privy to because there are comfort sins. They make us feel good. They have an interesting pleasure to them. And then when we're finished engaging in those private sins, we are often followed by guilt. And then sometimes these private sins lead to public sins. So there's a lot going on here. You could probably guess where this is going, but I don't want to give too much of it away, even though by the time you start reading That Dark Place, which is a superb novel, you are going to enjoy the story. So let's dig into it. What is That Dark Place about? That Dark Place involves, uh, has a starting point of a girl at the age of 11 years old, who as a result of her classmates in school, she hears certain words, hears about certain experiences, mental pictures form of things that they've seen, or one of them is talking about how her brother gets into something called a chat room and she caught him. It starts off with confusion and excitement. And if you're confused about a subject, you know, what do we tend to do? We go online and we search it out. Well, that's the same thing that happened to this young girl at the age of 11. She started searching out the words and the things that she was hearing from her classmates that, you know, they're the same age. And it turns into something that is a fascination where she gets addicted, essentially, to pornography. And but it goes beyond that because she starts giving in to the requests in chat rooms and starts taking pictures and, and giving them to oftentimes older men. And uh, so you'd think that it would immediately become dark, but it doesn't. It doesn't. She becomes fascinated with it. She enjoys what the praise that she's getting, believing that things are as good as they can get, basically. And uh, until one day uh, at the age of 14, she has a one-time experience with one of these young men, teenager, that she met online, and he ends up getting her pregnant. And that gets her kicked out of her home. Well, if anybody has read any of the books up to that point, there are the Lawton family that is headed by a man named Brent, who is a police chief. And this family takes her in and basically makes her one of their own family, along with their other three kids. And the other part of the book is the life of a man by the name of Drew. Drew is in his 30s. He's recently divorced because of his pornography addiction. But as with a lot of things, getting into something and trying to keep excited about it gets you to going into darker and darker things. And so this man goes past some lines that should never be explored. And he gets involved in uh, essentially kiddie porn. And as a result of his desire for younger and younger, he's wanting to meet not women now. He's wanting to meet and have interesting times with teenagers. So that's where this story starts off. And he meets this girl, Elizabeth, the other main character online, and the two of them flirt. 
he gets out of her. I don't know that he was trying for it, but he got out of her the city in which she worked. And that's all he needed to start formulating a plan to accidentally cross the path and uh, meet her face to face. And she's completely unaware of who he is when they first meet. And it gets dark from there. You can tell where this is going, dear listener. And so we're going to just leave you kind of hanging on there because the story does go there. The story is called That Dark Place for a Reason. (laughs) You may want to know. But as soon as you start to hear me talk about private sins, I'm sure some of you heads may have gone down. Your face may have gotten warm and you may have started to fidget in your seat because we know what these private sins are. And we need to talk about sexual immorality because it's the one sin that the Apostle Paul says, flee sexual immorality. A lot of the other sins out there are done to us. But when it comes to sexual immorality, he said, you have to run away from it because God gives us a godly outlet for our sexual pleasures and our sexual desires, which is called marriage. But then there's the darker side of that. So let's talk about that for a minute. What are some stats you can share with us about pornography and Christians and how it affects the youth and all of that? Okay, so I'm going to run through these rather quickly. You can find these stats online, but 42% of the general population, age 13 and up, watches porn, okay, compared to 13% of practicing Christians. So we're talking about 13% from 13 on up to 99 of Christians, okay? So the second stat is 72% of non Christian males from 13 to 24 watch porn. But here's a scary stat here. Now that's compared to 41% of Christian males from 13 to 24 years old. Now these are Christians, 41%. Now it doesn't stop there. I'm going to skip one of the stats to get to the females. 36% of non-Christian females from 13 to 24 watch porn. We're talking more than one third of the general population of women. And of course, the Christian component for 13 to 24 is 13%. I should have searched this out better. This is an older stat, this 13%. I know that it is upwards now into the 20% and that Christian women, you think it would be mostly Christian male and it is, but to have a percentage so high of Christian women that are involved in pornography, it's almost staggering for the mind, but it's because women are drawn by the heart and they want relationship stimulation of their minds. And you know what? You start excusing certain types of behavior because you enjoy what happens up to that point. It's that wooing. And then you get to the point to where, you know what? I enjoy this so much in my mind. I wonder what it looks like on the screen. And then there you are. You're captured and you're stuck and you're praying to God. You know, 88% of Christian female porn users attend church regularly. 81% pray regularly, and 72% read the Bible regularly. And so the problem is that nobody's talking about it. 6.7% of Christian women who said that they were involved in porn said that only that 6.7% experienced a message from their church dealing with porn. So such a great need to hear somebody talk about it, and so very few people are hearing it. It's interesting that you mentioned some of these statistics because people tend to think of pornography being something only in the realm of men when women are just as affected by it as well, because we're both, get this, sexual beings, (laughs) if you will. Both genders have sexual desires. And so not a shock that both of us would be titillated by the same imagery. And this is important. What's really important is that we're starting off very young. Children are being exposed to pornography younger and younger ages. There is a push, which I think is absolutely demonic to put this stuff in front of our kids because they can become numb to it and then they start younger and younger. So these are really serious topics. And here's the scary thing. Here's one more stat. And this is the scariest one, I think. Intentional pornography, okay, for adolescents. This is this is putting pornography in front of adolescents, okay, from ages 10 to 17. 34% 34 percent of children 10 to 17 have been intentionally exposed to pornography. And that should make you shiver. 
And so nowadays there's this push to take our children and do lots of weird things to them. And so we are giving you this information not to embarrass you. We know, dear listener, you may be one of these people looking at porn. This is not here for us to judge you or to make you feel bad and make you say you're not a good Christian. One of the statistics you gave, Frank, was that many of these people go to church and they're reading their Bibles. They see porn as just something they may dabble in. They may see it as something they may go with. And you're saying it starts to become part of their lives, like with a character, Drew. It became something he clung to. And as he continued to cling to it, began to morph and continue to get worse and worse. And I should let you know, dear listeners, we only gave you the tip of the iceberg with this story. This happens like the first 10 chapters. <laughs> so you have a lot more story to delve into. Now, Frank, you know, some people are going to be like, you know, PJ, Frank, I don't really feel comfortable talking about this. Why would you have to do a show about it? What would you say to them? I say because we have to expose God's grace. We have to let everybody know that irrespective of how deep and how dark things are, whether it's been done to you or whether you're the one that's been doing it, God's grace is still bigger than that. His desire to forgive you is still bigger than that. There is nothing that controls you that cannot be broken by God. And I'm going to tell you this very, very quickly. My wife, back when she was just still my girlfriend, had found an email that had some uh, attached pictures to it from somebody that went back, I don't know, 20, 30 years. And as a result of that coming out and her challenging me with it, I got an answer to a prayer. I had gone to a church service where my pastor said, there are some scary prayers that we all need to be praying. One of them is search me, O Lord, comes from scripture. That's a, a direct quote, search me, O Lord. And the other one is break me. So if you're willing to say, God, search me, search my heart, allow him to expose the things that need to be rooted out. That's step one. Step two is the scary prayer. God, break me. Do whatever it takes. I'm giving you permission to break me, to do whatever it takes to root this out of me. And for me, it was my wife stumbling upon an email and having to have that conversation with me. And that's when I was willing to finally admit that I had a secret sin. And that's where the breaking began. And it was it was amazing and it was beautiful as much as it was scary and embarrassing. And it lets you know there is hope, that there is hope for these strongholds that take hold of us. And I say us because we all are dealing with something and we all have strongholds, particularly in this particular issue, because it's so easily acceptable and it's accepted. There are people who say, well, Where's your porn stash? You know, what websites do you go to? You don't even have to pay for porn. Back in the day when I was growing up, you had to pay for it. Now you don't have to pay for it. It's readily accessible. And there are laws that some states are trying to pass where at the very least they try to protect the children from getting access to it by having a valid driver's license. There are people who are against that. (laughs) So, yeah, there's a lot going on with this topic. But I want us to end on a good note that. When it is dark, the light shines even brighter. So guess what? You don't have to stay in that dark place. And if you get your copy of That Dark Place available online, wherever books are sold, you are going to see what God can do in the midst of darkness. Frank, I have just enjoyed our time together. You know I did. I can't wait to have you back. But in the few moments we have left, go ahead and let people know how they can get in touch with you. Well, it's easy. Just go to W. Franklin Lattimore. That's L-A-T-T-I-M-O-R-E dot com. W. Franklin Lattimore dot com. You can take a look at all of the books. There are links to my blogs. Their means for contacting me are all on that site. I got to ask you, Frank, in the few moments we have left, you are going to ask me a sci-fi question. And I want to know if I get my sci-fi together right. I want to know. I'm glad you reminded me. All right. So you are a sci-fi nerd as I am. And one of the things that I just found out, the second Star Wars movie, Empire Strikes Back, a lot of it took place on a planet called Hoth. And a lot of people were like, how can these animals like the Tauntaun and the, um, uh, what was the name of that snow monster? Sheesh, I can't remember. But uh, how could they exist on a planet where there's no vegetation? Well, they still don't really have a good answer for that. But I did find out one really neat answer. And that is for a Tauntaun who lives on this planet. Parker, do you know what the internal temperature is of a Tauntaun? 
No, I don't know what the term temperature of a tauntaun is. Hadn't really thought about it. It's lukewarm. Nice! Yes! Yes! Yes, I love it. Oh my gosh, thank you. You know, I'm not, you know what's so funny? When you mentioned Star Wars, the first thing my listeners are going to say is like, PJ's not a Star Wars fan. She's a Trekkie, right? But I do remember Star Wars. <laughs> so, <laughs> I love it. I clap for you. Can you hear me clapping? I'm clapping for you right now. <laughs> oh, gosh. If I heard that joke you put on Facebook when they went to the store, <laughs> it took me a minute to get it. But when I got it, I was dying. <laughs> I was actually dying. Our listeners are like, womp, womp. I could tell our listeners are doing that. Yeah, not all my humor is fantastic. Oh, I love it. Perfect. Yeah, so also, I just want to say this. You're going to find humor laced through my books. So don't think that everything is dark and there aren't any fun moments. Well, that makes sense. I actually think God's humor in general is underrated. I think God is always cracking up at us. I think we make him laugh a lot. And I think he has just a great sense of humor. And he allows us to have that humor that breaks up the darkness, too. So when you read That Dark Place, you're going to see those hints of Frank's humor in there. But you're also going to see the light and you're going to see that no matter how dark it gets, the light always shines brighter in the darkness. So, Frank, thank you so much for being with us today on the show. Can't wait to have you back and have you back real soon. It's my pleasure, Parker, and I'm looking forward to it. And we were talking today to Frank Lattimore. He is the author of The Other Round Saga, four books for your enjoyment. Today, we were talking about the last book in the series called That Dark Place. Go ahead and pick up your copy today on Amazon or wherever books are sold. Now, I know we touched on a really heavy topic today, but I encourage you, dear listener, my author out there, is this something that the Lord is calling you to talk about? Is he calling you to be brave about confronting our private sins, the ones we don't want anyone to know about? Has he taken you out of darkness, just like Frank, and into his light? Has he broken chains over your own spiritual state and you want to encourage someone else out there? What are you waiting for? Go ahead, pick up the pen and write stuff. Thank you so much for joining me for this edition of The Right Stuff. I'm the Queen Parker J, and you have a wonderful, absolutely glorious, blessed day.